What is going on everybody? Welcome back to another full self-driving beta video. We are on the latest version, 11.3.2. There's this whole genre of videos on YouTube of people driving their Teslas around. And today we're gonna to be doing a drive we've done a couple of times before, but now we have version 11 and this drive does involve, I believe, some highway. I haven't actually looked at the route yet. Or more accurately, showing how the Teslas drive themselves around testing out Tesla's full self-driving capabilities. These videos are from a user named Dirty Tesla. Sometimes his car does great. Other times, not so much. This roundabout is not mapped, and so the car screws it up pretty much every time. Now, what does it do? It pretty much always goes that way. And it does it okay, but then it reroutes and it adds a lot of time, and I just don't want to, so I will let it go as long as I can, but then I'm going to take over so we don't go the wrong way. Dirty Tesla's car doesn't do anything too dangerous in this video, more annoying. Other drivers have recorded more nervous-making experiences. Here's user Black Tesla. Here we go. It's doing it already. Okay, so see, we're, we're failing, 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 failing. Stop completely. Now it's trying to get over, and the police station's right behind us. What's going to happen? Please don't pull us over. We look drunk. I wonder, have you spent any time watching these videos that are pretty popular on, on YouTube and other places of people testing out um, Tesla full self-driving mode? Yes, I've spent actually a, a lot of time watching them. Um, there's a whole range of testers, so it's, it's really interesting to see what people's experiences are like. That's Fez Siddiqui, who covers Tesla, Twitter, and tech for The Washington Post. What's fascinating about these videos is that most of them are made by true believers. They want the company to succeed, but they're also honest when the tech fails and when Tesla's promises fall short. I think there's like an inherent sort of tension there, right? Like they're boosters and believers in the technology. Um, you know, I've written a story about this before, about like this mission that these um, beta testers believe that they're on to help Elon improve the technology but they're also getting a first glimpse at how it's operating in the real world. And they're also like online influencers. And so they're getting some really good, um, informative, uh, groundbreaking content um, that then they're, they're going to publish. That content isn't always great for Tesla which last month was forced by regulators to recall some 360,000 cars with the full self-driving system because they kept making dangerous mistakes. Fez recently wrote a story saying that the chief problem plaguing Tesla's full self-driving ambitions was the boss himself. So today on the show, how Elon Musk pushed for and undermined Tesla's quest to make self-driving cars. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, and you're listening to What Next TBD, a show about technology, power, and how the future will be determined. Stick around. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned, doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant, doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope, Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. Sax.com editors are always tracking the top styles that are trending right now. Tailored blazers and midi dresses are selling out at Saks.com, especially from brands like Veronica Beard and The Row. And Saks.com editors are seeing Lueve's oversized tote on the streets of New York, Milan, and Paris. If you want your own free personalized trend recommendations, Saks.com stylists can do that and more. Plus, there's free shipping and returns all the time at Saks.com. The story of Tesla's self-driving ambitions begins in 2014. That year, the company started giving its Model S cars hardware that could automate some aspects of highway driving, like steering and braking. It called the feature Autopilot, but it wasn't active yet. In 2015, Autopilot was rolled out for real as a software update. 
full self-driving began as a beta test for a small group of Tesla owners in 2020. I asked Fez to explain the differences between the two. The way that Tesla defines full self-driving is auto steer on city streets. It's part of a larger package called autopilot. It's kind of like you don't automatically have full self-driving if you have autopilot. But if you have full self-driving, you do have autopilot. So autopilot is the larger universe here. It is Tesla's driver assistance software. You can think of it as a sort of cruise control on steroids. It helps the driver maneuver. Uh, it's a largely highway system from on-ramp to off-ramp. So that means it will stay in a lane, follow the lane lines, follow the speed limits, ideally make lane changes and keep like a, a safe following distance behind other cars, ideally. Full self-driving expands some of those capabilities to city and residential streets, which you know, as any driver I'm sure can imagine, can be orders of magnitude, that's an Elonism, uh, more complicated. And how does it work? Like, what is what are the inputs for full self-driving? So it's a combination of perception and processing and I suppose you can say uh, decision-making. So it is taking in all kinds of raw data that it's gathering from eight cameras that have a surround view of the car. And so you can imagine those cameras are seeing out the front of the car. They are seeing from the sides of the car. They're seeing from the back of the car. They definitely have some um, advantages over the human driver who cannot look in all of those directions at the same time. The cameras are gathering that data and Tesla's on board computer is processing that data and determining, you know, what is the car actually seeing? Because the image to the computer is just pixels. So the car has to decide, what is that in front of it? Is hmm. that a person crossing the street? Is that a stroller? Is that a dog? Is that a truck? And so they're processing that and then deciding, there's a decision-making structure there, what to do next. The full self-driving package costs around $15,000. Initially, Tesla limited the program to people who had demonstrated a certain safety score. But in November, the company opened it up to any North American driver. The company essentially treats people who have the package as beta testers. They can report any bugs back to Tesla. How many people have this feature in their cars, the, the full self-driving beta? So as of the last approximate count, it was around 360,000. And I think one thing that might be interesting to lay out is like how this is different from Google's self-driving cars or, or Cruise or some of these other autonomous vehicles. So when I talk about autopilot and full self-driving, the thing you have to realize as, you know, maybe a casual observer is that the driver is supposed to be paying attention at all times. The driver is supposed to always be able to take over and be hyper vigilant. So like have your hands a, a fraction of an inch away from the steering wheel. Yeah, if not uh, directly on the steering wheel. And so these other systems, Cruise, Waymo, these are autonomous, fully autonomous systems. So they ultimately would not require a driver at all. That is a key difference from Tesla's system, which is a level two in terms of... Um, there's all of this engineering terminology for like what the levels of autonomy are. And with level two, you know, that is not a system that you're capable of, you know, stopping oversight of. Autonomous cars like Cruise, which is owned by GM, and Waymo, which is part of Alphabet, are loaded with tons of cameras to capture all the angles around a car. But cameras can't see everything. So these cars are also equipped with radar and LIDAR to fully decipher what's around them. So LIDAR is supplementing cameras by building a dot matrix of whatever that object is. I know we're getting in the weeds here. But it, it, if you can imagine, I'll take like an animal. A camera will see an animal in like some kind of a blur, right? And so it might see like a horse on the side of the road. And for that camera, there might be some granularity where it's like, oh, 
is that like a horse or is that like a dog or what if that's a cow? <laughs> the LIDAR is going to use a bunch of dots and trace the outline of that thing. And it's going to help the camera. It's like sort of a second reference that will help the camera decide what exactly that thing is. Why is this relevant? Because what's going to run across a four-lane highway? Will it be a cow behind a pen on the side of the highway or will it be a deer on the side of the highway? And if the camera and the LIDAR determine, oh, hey, that's a deer, that car might react differently. And so these other companies are using really sophisticated hardware that's often more expensive as a way to supplement their cameras. Tesla took a different choice. It's a mass market product Hundreds of thousands of people now have it, and they wanted to not only simplify, but save money. And there were all, all kinds of supply chain concerns post-COVID. And so they took the decision to remove radar and pursue autonomy using cameras only. The way that Elon justified this was, he said, when we are driving, we're using our eyes. And so why can't cameras <laughs> do the same thing? Since the radar was removed, w w what do we know about how the cars are behaving? Are there more crashes, more incidents? You know, what are they up to? So there seem to be more documented instances of what's called phantom braking, which is where the car suddenly uh, jolts and slows down. This can happen at high speeds, highway speeds even, uh, when the car is detecting a false positive. So if we're going back to the example of the car seeing something on the side of the road, all of a sudden uh, the car is seeing something and it's overly cautious in reaction to that. You can imagine if there was something else supplementing the camera, the car might think it sees something maybe, and then the other piece of hardware says, no, you're not actually seeing anything, and the car continues. But with the camera, something as simple as a raindrop or a snowflake or like a bright streak of light can obstruct that camera and create a false positive. There are more instances of this phantom braking and there are more and uh, more public crashes. But we don't know at this point if that's entirely attributable to any of these factors or just the fact that there are more Teslas on the road with full self-driving at this time. Tesla was giving it to tens of thousands of more drivers. In, in February, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, issued a recall notice. What did it say? NHTSA was concerned that Teslas were failing to adhere to speed limits, stop signs, and they weren't stopping at intersections um, entirely. So it might have been like a slow stop or a rolling stop, but they basically weren't obeying basic traffic laws. This is something that I've looked into a lot. It's sometimes can seem to Tesla that this is nitpicky. You know, they had an issue where Tesla was letting cars engage in like rolling stops, like proceeding through a stop sign at like one or two miles an hour. And they're like, I think Elon Musk at one point called them like the fun police. <laughs> um, but the truth is like, the regulators way into any of this is they have to be able to enforce like basic traffic laws and safety requirements. And so this seemed like a case of this is so basic. Please get a handle on this. Um, and then we can talk about all the other stuff. You know, in my experience with Tesla, um, they don't often respond when when someone like me, a mere mortal, wants to talk about issues like this. How do they respond when regulators say, oh, hey, you can't do a rolling stop? Regulators have a bit more power than, you know, us mere mortals. <laughs> There's a little bit of hand-wringing. They feel a little bit um, ganged up on. But they know that regulators carry all kinds of enforcement authority, the ability to levy fines, the ability to potentially impact who and how they can roll out this kind of software. So it wouldn't be smart to ignore them, one. And two, it's sort of fundamental. I mean, you, you have caught them when you say, your cars are rolling through a stop sign, please fix this. As opposed to something 
way more complicated. And there are all kinds of way more complicated issues for regulators to potentially tackle and get their hands around. But uh, with something this fundamental, you they don't really have an argument against it. When we come back, why Tesla is willing to take on so much risk. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is a different kind of credit card. It gives you up to 3% unlimited cash back on everything you buy. It's real cash that never expires or loses value. And you can use it on anything. Grab a morning coffee, pick up a tab, or pay back a friend. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Daily cash is available via Apple Cash Card, issued by Green Dot Bank, member FDIC, or as a statement credit. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, when you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. As if the McCrispy couldn't get any better, Bacon and Ranch just entered the chat. The Bacon Ranch McCrispy, available at participating McDonald's for a limited time. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba. One of the things that stands out in your reporting is, you know, Tesla has pushed full self-driving out to, to hundreds of thousands of people. It can do that with these automatic updates. Um, but the thing that stood out to me is their appetite for risk. Because, you know, these are real people driving around in these cars right now. What have you learned about how the company views kind of real-time rollout of these features and risk? So I think there's a really um, interesting parallel right now with OpenAI and ChatGPT. I mean, if you imagine like all of, I mean, any tech company worth their salt must have been pursuing some version of this. But OpenAI comes out and rolls out theirs, which is obviously, you know, maybe this is never finished, but like it's unfinished, it's unpolished. But people used it and they were blown away. And I'm sure some of the other companies that were pursuing large language models were like, well, we have these capabilities, but we didn't think it was ready. And if you're constantly saying it's not ready and sort of second guessing yourself, then it's hard to get to a point where you are actually confident enough to roll out your product. And Tesla realized like they are not going to get, it's the March of nines, they are not going to get to 100% capability, success, efficacy without some amount of risk. And so they realized early on that let's roll this out, let's gather as much data as possible, and let's improve our software based on the data that we obtain. And every second that they wait, they're potentially giving up any advantage that they might have to someone who is maybe taking a more a slower and some would say more responsible approach. So their advantage here is to put it in the hands of as many people as possible and say to regulators, uh, come and take it. I love your analogy, but at the same time, like chat GPT isn't driving down the street past a preschool. Absolutely. Elon Musk has talked about this. He talked about this, I believe, at an event last year that there are going to be documented instances of 
crashes um, with sometimes serious consequences. And the people um, and their states are going to find out about this. He argued that the people who are saved won't know that they've been saved by this technology, but this is how they're looking at it. They are looking at it as a way into addressing the 40,000 annual U.S. road deaths. The question is, will the public have any tolerance for any of those coming um, at the hands of autonomy? In his reporting on Tesla, Fez spoke to several people inside the company about the unrelenting pressure to make full self-driving work and make it work quickly. There was definitely a feeling of urgency inside the company. And, you know, Musk's edicts, uh, often tweeted edicts, uh, filtered through the rank and filtered down to the rank and file. You know, managers realized they had to react to these sudden timelines that he was imposing. Tesla was hyper aware of the public perception of the technology. The story talks about how at one point, one of the people I talked to told me the company built in essentially bumpers on Lombard Street because Lombard Street is a famously difficult uh, road to navigate, or at least it's a place for people to show off the skills of their autonomy-related pursuits. And Tesla built in bumpers because they're like, if our car keeps screwing up here, you know, it's a place with a lot of eyes and that'll be bad. So Tesla realized, or, or Musk realized that he wanted to put this in the hands of the public, and he made a promise that there would be a million robo-taxis by 2020. If you were coding for him or you were labeling images and helping train the AI, you felt the brunt of those promises. And you felt all of a sudden you learned that there was aggressive workplace monitoring, that your mouse clicks and your keystrokes and uh, every pixel that you laid down was being monitored. And if you were stagnant for too long, uh, your job was suddenly at risk. I was really struck by the number of people in your story who didn't want their names attached to what they said to you. Is that because they were scared of Elon? I think they know the uh, track record that Tesla has. Um, Certainly it hasn't been kind to people who have spoken out. And whether it's the company or its lawyers or Elon's lawyers, I think they feel that the cost for them is not worth it. At this point, I have lost track of how many episodes we have done about Twitter and all things Elon Musk. But but in the course of doing those shows, you know, we talked about the number of engineers that he pulled over from Tesla to work at Twitter. And a question that I'm really interested in is like, how does that, how does that affect the companies. Does does Tesla suffer when that happens? I asked this question over the course of um, this reporting, and I, the sense that I got was that Twitter became Elon's priority over a pretty significant period for Tesla, where there was a lot of investor pressure. Investors were concerned that, like, hey, you are taking the key part of your empire and you're risking it to help turn around this social media site. And so it's not like this wasn't some side project. This was like Elon taking some of the engineers he trusts the most over to Twitter to help solve that company's problem. So of course it affects Tesla because suddenly Tesla is deprived of those people and their work, even if momentarily it's like they can only do so much. And if they're suddenly, if Twitter is their new mission, then what happens to full self-driving? I talked about this on the show around the course of Tesla's Investor Day, but they have not been rolling out new models. There were price cuts on a lot of the existing models. And, you know, as you mentioned, Elon has a tendency to make big promises. I wonder if if that is starting to catch up with him. Does, does the big promise and then maybe under-delivering, like, is that being noticed? I think people have caught on. I mean, even among the fanboys, there's like a common joke about like, oh, he said two weeks and like, that means a couple months probably. Hmm. Or like, oh, he said like a few months, that might mean a year. (laughs) So people get it. I don't know that he's going to stop doing that. And I feel like all of Silicon Valley does that to some extent. Oh, definitely. 
I, I think the way that he views it is, you know, if if I if I lay out, and I think he said some version of this, like if I lay out a longer timeline, then it will take exactly that long. Why not give yourself less time and see what you can deliver? Like when, when I when I sort of cite a schedule, it is actually the schedule I think is true. It's it's not some fake schedule that I don't think is true. Um, I may be delusional. That is entirely you know possible. Maybe it's happened from time to time, um, but it's it's. It's never, um, you know, some knowingly fake deadline ever. And, you know, when you deliver on a moonshot, I don't know that people necessarily remember every time you failed. If you think about SpaceX landing reusable rockets, there's so many failures there, but they succeeded in making that technology possible. And I don't know if people harp on the failures as much. And I imagine they view the failures as cr crucial to ultimately succeeding at it. So is it wearing on people? I'm sure. Are people at their wits end with his promises? I don't think the people who back him, which is like a substantial group of people, I don't think they're there yet. One of the things I wonder every time we do a story about Tesla is, is this sort of duality, right? Like, clearly, Tesla has changed the electric vehicle market in this country and, and in the world. But also, we are having this conversation because of your reporting on some of the problems with these cars. And I just come away wondering every single time, are they safe? Is full self-driving safe? There's sort of a like counterintuitive answer to this, I think. From the people... I've spoken with who have studied autonomy and, and who generally understand this technology, the better it gets, the less safe it is because there is a risk of people becoming complacent. There is a risk of people no longer paying attention or having their hands at the ready at all times. So in this stage where it's glitchy and people can expect mistakes, we are not necessarily at the peak of danger. <laughs> it's it's where the technology starts to be better and like much better, not incrementally, but like orders of magnitude better that you end up risking all kinds of uh, just this sort of sea change in how people drive um, or view driving. And so I don't think we're there um, but I think the model creates that eventuality, right? The model says this is going to keep getting better and better and you're going to be able to be less reliant or the car is going to rely less and less on you and you are the only thing stopping the car from making mistakes. Elon Musk has said publicly that, that the thing that separates Tesla from its competitors is full self-driving. You know, he says the difference between it being worth a lot of money and being worth basically zero is is full self-driving. How important is it to the future of the company that that full self-driving, you know, that they get it right? It's vital. I mean, if you think about um, the car industry traditionally is not the most high margin. Production is notoriously difficult. I think the leaders of Tesla like to point out that, like, I believe it was every American auto company since Chrysler had failed. So Tesla was the first one to come along in, uh, what, around 100 years as just a car company producing electric cars in an increasingly crowded market where you have juggernauts in consumer, in consumer electronics um, and China. Uh, are you necessarily best positioned to dominate this? And does that justify your position as not only the world's most valuable automaker, but the richest person on earth? I'm not sure it does. But with this potentially life-changing technology, Tesla is something else entirely. It's a technology company, and it's an AI company, and it's, it's not just this sort of low-margin manufacturing-based auto company. Is that technology going to be ready for prime time anytime soon? I don't think it's as close as maybe some of the leaders of these companies would like it to be, but there are applications of it that I think 
can start to work more reliably. Highway driving and autonomous trucking is a big area of interest for these companies. And I think those seem a little bit simpler or at least a little bit more achievable in the short term. But just in terms of city driving and the type of bet uh, that Tesla is pursuing with full self-driving, it seems tough in the short term, and especially on the timeline that Musk laid out. So what happens to Tesla? Like, does it have does it have the cash? Does it have the people? Can it get this thing done before its competitors, you know, are able to to take its market share? Does Tesla have a leg up on its competitors in the auto industry? I think so. Like, because of this bet that it has taken. It's not the only company that's pursuing this kind of, um, that's trying to turn driver assistance into something closer to autonomy. I don't know that there's another company in the US or Europe, at least, that is where Tesla is at with autonomy. I just don't know what that means for its valuation in the long term. It's kind of like, I, I think companies in Silicon Valley have like a 10-year runway. It's basically like you, you have to prove your model, your economic model within 10 years of getting all the startup money. And Tesla has sort of proven its model by showing a quarterly profit building cars. It's more, does it justify its sky-high valuation as the world's most valuable automaker? I don't know how long that runway is because as you know, at this point, Elon Musk is such an exception to like every understood rule of how this industry and like how the world works. So I guess we'll see. Fes Siddiqui, thank you so much for talking with me and for your reporting. Thank you so much. Fez Siddiqui covers Tesla, Elon Musk, and Silicon Valley for The Washington Post. And that is it for our show today. What Next TBD is produced by Evan Campbell. Our show is edited by Jonathan Fisher. Special thanks this week to Cameron Drews. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of Audio for Slate. TBD is part of the larger What Next family, and we're also part of Future Tense, a partnership of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America. And if you like us, you really like us, the best way to support us is to become a Slate Plus member. Just head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus to sign up. All right, we will be back next week with more episodes. I'm Lizzie O'Leary. Thanks for listening.